oversight hearing on the 2000 census. Today, a House Government Reform Subcommittee heard testimony from Census Bureau Director Ken Pruitt and others on response rates and census operations. Florida Congressman Dan Miller chairs the two and a half hour hearing. Good morning, uh, quorum being present, the uh, subcommittee will come to order. Um, there will be a vote in a short period of time, but at least we can get started with our opening statements. Today we continue our series of oversight hearings into the 2000 Census. Coming before the subcommittee today will be Dr. Kenneth Pruitt, Director of the Bureau of the Census, and Christopher Mim, Acting Associate Director, Federal Management and Workforce Issues at the U.S. General Accounting Office. Before I go further, I'd like to say to everyone listening or watching this hearing that if you haven't mailed in your census form, long or short, please take the time to fill it out and mail it back now. The census cannot be a success without your participation. The money needed to ensure that you have the roads, emergency services, daycare, schools, and other vital services are tied directly to the responses you give on your census questionnaire. If you do not have a questionnaire or a concern that you might have missed, you can call the Census Bureau's Telephone Questionnaire Assistance Line for help. That number is 1-800-471-9424. Let me repeat, 1-800-471-9424. If you've already mailed in your form, thank you for doing your part to ensure that America is accurately counted. I've read Director Pruitt's testimony. I must say that I'm impressed by the complexity of the current ongoing operations. For example, the Bureau deserves praise for the mail response website, now available at www.census.gov. That's www.census.gov. The ability for virtually any city or county to look and see the response rates daily, what it was in 1990 and how it compares to the national average is an important addition to this census. And I might add that I have personally been checking on Manatee, Sarasota, and Hillsborough counties on a daily basis, and I so I appreciate having that. Today, there are a number of different issues that I would like to address. The ongoing recruiting efforts as we approach the most difficult stage of this, of the full enumeration, the non-response follow-up, which will be the most demanding task facing the Bureau in full enumeration. The current mail response rate on which the success of the census hangs, and, uh, and the ongoing controversy regarding the long-form questionnaire. Clearly, the biggest controversy surrounding the census has been the perceived intrusiveness and invasiveness of the privacy uh, and privacy of the long form. In 1998, the Census Bureau distributed this binder uh, with the long form questions and explanations to all members, and the Senate was asked for comments and the House. Few comments were received. Clearly, all members did not know at that time what the level of dissatisfaction would be just a mere two years later. However, from the moment census forms were being received, it was clear that this was a number one complaint received by the subcommittee. While the long form has always been less popular than the short form, the attitudes towards the 2000 long form seem to be particularly intense, despite the fact that it is the shortest ever and only has one new question added since 1980. During the 1998 dress rehearsals, the long form response rate was between 10 and 15 percent points lower than the short form. However, this information was not provided to Congress until June 99 after the questionnaire had been approved. From the first day that the forms were being received at millions of homes around the nation, members of Congress were receiving phone calls from constituents who were very upset about the long form. While some in Congress tried to downplay the extent of the problem, it was clear to me that this would be the biggest issue next to sampling that we would have to deal with in this census. Every major newspaper in the nation has written about the long form of the privacy issue. Electronic media from talk radio to television have weighed in. It would be a mistake or a callous political move to lay the blame for this controversy at the feet of Republicans. This Republican Congress has been nothing but committed to the census. Republicans have said from the start that the Census Bureau would get the resources it needed to conduct a fair and accurate census. Republicans have kept that promise. In fact, numerous members have promoted the census in their districts in a number of different ways, including census in the school events and public service announcements, like the sample we're about to show right now.
This is Congressman Sherry Bollert reminding you that Census 2000 is here. By taking just a few minutes to fill out your census form, you can help ensure that our area's voice is heard. Answers to Census 2000 questions help determine how public funds for education and transportation are distributed. All answers are confidential under federal law. Call the Census 2000 office 315-732-8122 or toll free 888-325-7733. Hello, I'm Trent Lott, Senator from Mississippi. And I'm 2nd District Congressman Benny Thompson. Benny and I are together on this one, support for Census 2000. In the last census, almost 56,000 Mississippians were missed. That's nearly enough to fill Jackson's Memorial Stadium. This undercount cost Mississippi an estimated $300 million in federal funds for things like education, transportation, and housing. An undercount could even cost you more. But that's not all. Without an accurate count in Census 2000, Mississippi could lose a congressional seat, weakening Mississippi's voice in Washington. The best way to make sure that Mississippi gets all the federal funding we are entitled to and hold on to all five of our congressional seats is for you to fill out your census form and return it to the Census Bureau. In Mississippi, everybody counts. We should all agree on this one. The census isn't about politics, it's about Mississippi. This is Mississippi's future. Please don't leave it blank. Hello, I'm Congressman Henry Bonilla. One of the reasons I ran for Congress in the first place is because I felt more attention should be drawn to the principles outlined in our Constitution. One of the specific points laid out by the framers involves making sure we are all accounted for. That's what the census is all about. Our Constitution calls for an actual enumeration, which means a count, of our population every 10 years. It's the year 2000 and time for us to all stand up and be counted. Fill out the form you receive in the mail in a few days and mail it back. It's simple and it makes a difference for your community. Cities and counties rely on this data when it comes to such things as building new roads and highways. It's also important to institutions like school districts. How can local leaders plan for the future if they don't know how many people live in a particular area to begin with? Do your duty as an American who believes in our Constitution. You're part of a nation that has reached incredible new heights. Fill out the census form so America's future can be as bright as our past. This is Congressman Lincoln diaz Ballard. Now is the time we can all do something for South Florida. It's easy and can mean so much. It's Census 2000. By taking just a few minutes to fill out your form and mailing it back, you can ensure that our community gets heard. Answers to Census 2000 help determine where roads go and where new schools are needed. The U.S. Census only comes around every 10 years, but its information is used throughout the decade. When your form arrives, please fill it out and mail it back. Your answers are confidential and protected by law. Census 2000. This is your future. Don't leave it blank. Hi, I'm Congressman Dan Miller, reminding you to complete and return your 2000 Census form. Your participation in the upcoming Census is important to your family, our community, and our country. So please, take a few minutes and fill out your census form. The reason why there is a long, there is a long form controversy is because millions of Americans aren't comfortable answering the questions. While some are quick to wag their political fingers, more thoughtful consideration of this topic would be constructive. Long before, before remarks by any congressional leaders, news stories were already talking about the long form problems. The NewsHour and PBS had an entire segment on privacy issue and the long form on March 23rd, almost two weeks ago. On 60 Minutes, one of the most popular news shows on television, was with almost 13 million weekly viewers, commentator Andy Rooney voiced to the nation two Sundays ago his criticism of the long form. He concluded his commentary by saying, quote, I am not going to fill out the long form. I'll send them about what a soldier has to give if he's captured in a war, my name, address, and social security number. Otherwise, Census Bureau count me out, end quote. In my hometown of Braden, Florida, my wife and I live next to an elderly lady in her 80s. She has trouble with her eyesight, so my wife assisted her in filling out her census form. There were several questions that she simply would not answer, including giving her phone number. She noted to my wife that Florida was a state that at one time sold its driver's license list and she was simply not going to give her phone number to the federal government. And while we all know that the census operates in a confidential environment, I believe that we must also realize that it is exceptionally difficult for government
and separated its entities. A violation of privacy on the state or local level in people's minds translates to all levels of government, including the federal level. To the average person, government is government. Another factor at work here is computer technology and internet age. While both have brought tremendous conveniences to our lives, grown our economy, and fundamentally changing the way Americans live, they have also brought new privacy concerns. While our government reaps the benefits of our technology prosperity, government must also share the burden of new privacy concerns. I also believe, sadly, that some of the recent scandals involving this administration, particularly the misuse of FBI files, have not helped in building America's trust in our government. And while no single cause may be blamed, clearly there has been a change in attitudes towards trust in government since 1990. Unfortunately, the 2000 census is feeling some of the brunt of this distrust. So what does all this mean? What should people do who have that long form sitting on their coffee table or kitchen counter? To put it simply, fill it out and mail it in. Congress has heard the dissatisfaction with the long form loud and clear. However, to change our approach in the middle of the census is impossible. In the coming months, this subcommittee will hold hearings on the long form and privacy issues. All sides will have an opportunity to come to the table and be heard. This includes privacy advocates who believe the information is not needed and government data users who say the information is indispensable. I must say, however, that this Congress will look to eliminate the long form in the 2010 census. Of course, we can't eliminate the long form in a vacuum. There is information that government needs to make informed decisions on the allocation of resources and the planning and distribution of $185 billion in funding. A new tool called the American Community Survey is being developed by the Census Bureau. Is that the answer? Maybe. This is going to take careful consideration by this subcommittee and eventually the Congress as a whole. What is clear is that Republicans and Democrats must both work together to promote the census. If one side or the other attempts to gain political advantage over the other during these critical weeks, then surely participation in the census will be hurt. An inaccurate census hurts America. An accurate census is in everyone's best interest. This is your future. Don't leave it blank. Ms. Maloney. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, and welcome to our, our witnesses, uh, Dr. Pruitt from the Census Bureau and Mr. Men from GAO. I've, I've been seeing so much of you lately. We're becoming very good friends. A April 1st uh, Census Day was uh, four days ago and major census operations are now underway. Though the most labor-intensive activities are yet to come, all signs now are very good. The largest peacetime mobilization ever in our history is underway, and I salute Director Pruitt and his professional staff for the excellent job to date. Right now, the key success indicator for the census is the mail-back response rate. And many households have mailed back their forms as of today. That stands at 55%, or about 67 million households. That still leaves 45% of our nation's households that have not returned their forms. And I urge everyone who has not mailed back their form to do so today to participate in this important civic ceremony. Fill out your form. Don't leave your future blank. At 55 percent, however, it seems that the estimated response rate of 61 percent will be met, and I'm hopeful it might be exceeded. The, the director has challenged the nation to reach 70 percent, and I hope, think we might reach that mark. I, I don't want it to sound too optimistic, but the hard work on the advertising campaign, the partnerships, and other promotional activities appear to be paying off. Other indicators are positive as well. Recruiting continues to go well, with the Bureau reaching its goal of 2.4 million qualified applicants by March 31st, almost three weeks ahead of schedule. 25.5 million forms have already been scanned with continued high accuracy. Update leave operations were successfully completed on schedule. Almost 6 million phone calls have gone to the 800 number, and 58,000 forms have, have been completed on the Internet. The, the other night I, I went out with uh, Chairman Miller at 4 o'clock in the morning uh, to watch the temporary employees that the Census has hired um, for, from the community count, and we were out counting the homeless. 
It was uh, very impressive to see the dedication and commitment of the workforce operating in the middle of the night in, in very difficult and sometimes uh, hazardous zones. So things are going about as well as could be expected operationally. Considering the doom and gloom of just a few months ago on both the hiring needs and the male response rate, things are in fact going remarkably well. The two major concerns raised by GEO last de December, the concerns around hiring and response rates, are clearly on track, which makes the recent comments about the long form by senior Republicans all the more unfortunate. Clearly, one contingency that GAO could not warn us about are some of the irresponsible comments that have been made in the news lately by elected officials who should know better. Uh, let me make clear I am not referring to my good friend and, and chairman of this subcommittee. Uh, chairman Dan Miller has been a supporter of the census, both the long form and the, the short form and he has been a, a strong supporter throughout this latest turmoil. But, but several uh, prominent Republicans, including Senator Lott, Governor Bush of Texas, and J.C. Watts, chair of the Republican Conference, have recently complained that the form is too nosy, that it asks too many questions. Some of these individuals have even made public statements suggesting that the Americans our, that our Americans, the residents in our country, should not complete their forms, despite the fact that refusing to complete these forms would be a violation of federal law. I think uh, these comments are outrageous, irresponsible, pandering to fringe groups in the radio talk show circuit. They threaten the success of the census by driving the response rate down. We have members of Congress saying that they, and I quote, believe in voluntarily cooperating, end quote, with the government, but, but beyond that, they won't follow the law. Since when did following the law in this country become a voluntary activity? What is really disingenuous is the fact that most of the questions on the long form have been around for decades. In fact, the long form is four questions shorter than the form in 1990. In fact, Ronald Reagan signed off on every single question in the 2000 census during preparations for the 1990 census, except for one that was required because of welfare reform that was added to find out how many children were being cared by grandparents. Over two years ago, as the content of the long and short forms was being finalized, every member of Congress received this book, this book on preparing for the Census 2000. And it lists all of the various questions to be asked, including a description of the need for asking it, along with the specific legal requirement supporting it. Congress is the person or the body that came forward with this directing the Census Bureau to ask by law certain questions. So this controversy at this late date strikes some as intentional sabotage. At the very least, it is willful disregard for a successful census. While it may not be intentional, it clearly shows an ignorance of how incredibly useful the census data is and how much of a difference it makes in the lives of millions of Americans. Let's look at the plumbing question that the radio talk shows and some elected officials uh, seem to focus on. Well, it may shock some, but there are places in this country where Americans don't have plumbing, in the Colonias, in Texas, on Indian reservations, and I dare say probably in rural communities in Mississippi. We need to know where substandard housing is so that we can work to correct the problem. Or let's look at question 17, concerning a person's physical, mental, or emotional condition in the last six months. Are some members saying they don't want to know how big a problem it is? How many disabled Americans there are in this country? How many disabled veterans? And where there are high concentrations of them 
so we know where the services are needed. It's my understanding that some of these leaders have started uh, to moderate their comments. Well, they shouldn't just moderate their comments. They should be in the forefront of urging all Americans to fill out their short and long forms completely. They should be urging their members to join them in supporting the census, all of the census. Anything less is unacceptable. Unless they move quickly to fully support the census, we, we run the risk of irreparable harm. And frankly, I am not only worried about the problems presented to response rates by this controversy, I'm also concerned about the welfare of hundreds of thousands of Americans who will be going door to door in their neighborhoods in the coming weeks. So today, I, I am happy to hear that things are going well. I sincerely hope they will continue to go well, despite the impact of the controversy over the long form. I look forward to hearing from Dr. Pruitt today on how he thinks this controversy will impact the census effort. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm sure you're pleased to see the uh, public service announcement that Con Senator Lott and Representative uh, Thompson put together to encourage Mississippians to complete their forms. Um, Mr. Ryan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. I wasn't planning on doing an opening statement, but I think um, given the controversy and the discussion over the long form, it's, it's prudent to make some suggestions. I I'll have you note that um, I'm doing a PSA right now throughout the state of Wisconsin with my uh, Democrat colleague from Milwaukee, Tom Barrett, urging everyone to fill out all of their census forms. I agree with that. And as a person who believes in limited government, uh, I think it's still very important that we fill out our census forms. You do hear a lot about this on talk radio. A lot of letters I'm getting in my office are, why do they want to know so much about me? And a lot of the talk radio hosts, and I think it's, it's a simplistic but an interesting way of looking at it, say, if you want the government uh, to know so much, if you want the government to do everything, then they need to know everything about you. Uh, that's the simple thing, and we're hearing that throughout the country today, and we're hearing it more in the year 2000 than we did in the year 1990. I think because there are more legitimate privacy concerns out there related to the technology we have in this country today. E-commerce, e the internet, these things I think are symptomatic of the new technologies that are emerging in our economy and our society that are causing for a rise in personal privacy concerns. So I'm not sure that this is all a, a some, some kind of asperity against our government but more of a general concern about privacy rights that is rising throughout the entire country. It's important that people know that you know, these are basically the same questions we had in 1990. It's a different country now in the year 2000. But I hope that we can get through this, and I hope we can learn some lessons on the long form. Now that we are in the information age, hopefully we can take some lessons from this long form issue on a bipartisan basis and work forward toward making sure that the next census is one that, that addresses these private par uh, privacy concerns. But with that, I think it's important that everybody fills out every part of their questions. And I look forward to hearing your testimony, Dr. Broden. And congratulations. I noticed that in Wisconsin, we hit a 59% initial response rate. We're really proud of that. And I think things are doing well, and the reports are showing that you're on your way. So I'm encouraged and look forward to hearing your testimony. You had to bring up that you beat Florida, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dr. Pruitt, if you would stand, and I believe, uh, uh, Mr. John Thompson, Mr. Marvin Raines, and Director, uh, Deputy Director Bill Barron will also be sworn in at this time in case they're needed to respond to some questions. If you raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before the subcommittee with the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. That the records say all four uh, answered in the affirmative. Um, Director Pruitt, would you proceed with an opening statement? Mr. Chairman, if I may preface my opening statement with a, uh, a statement of sympathy for the unhappy evening you spent Monday night. I, uh, I hope that a year from now uh, you have a happier Monday night. <laughs> uh, At least we made it to the finals. Oh, uh, Florida Gators. You're talking about our homeless count. I'm not asking any questions. <laughs> Uh, when I last testified, um, the focus was, of course, on whether the Census Bureau could pull off the many complex and massive operations. Uh, all of these operations were conducted successfully with no major problems that would put the Census at risk. In your letter of invitation, Mr. Chairman, you asked for the status of the nationwide mail response rate, uh, what those rates translate into for the non-response follow-up workload. As of this writing, uh, as you both mentioned, the national mail response rate, as posted on the Internet, is 55%. In a few hours, we will update that to 57 percent. Uh, this does not reflect what we expect to be an April 1 effect. 
We are not yet certain, but we are cautiously optimistic that we will achieve the 61 percent on which we based our budgeting and staffing program. April 11th is the cutoff date for identifying housing units that have not mailed back a questionnaire so that we can include them in the non-response follow-up workload. We will continue to process mail returns after that date. On April 17th, we will produce a late mail return file that we will transmit to the local census offices so they can delete these addresses from their non-response follow-up assignments. You also asked, sir, for an update on the status and a brief overview of Census 2000 operational issues, timelines, readiness for key activities and dates that lay ahead. On many of these issues, the GAO will shortly be testifying, and thus I will be very brief. We began and completed the update leave operation as planned. Telephone questionnaire assistance centers also began on March 3rd and will run through June 8th, and outbound calling from the TQA sites as part of our coverage edit program will continue through mid-June. We have answered nearly 6 million calls. Just over 4% of those calls were unable to get through. Almost all of those were on the first two days. There were also some problems in validating the questionnaire data that was taken over the telephone. These problems have now been resolved. The advanced letter provided an opportunity for those who want a language form, and we've received about 2.5 million language form requests thus far. In the mail-out mailback areas of the country, there were some households that received duplicate questionnaires. This occurred because during all the overlapping processes used to build the master address file, we wanted to minimize the chance that we would eliminate an address that should be retained. We have procedures in place to eventually remove those duplicate addresses from our file before the final data are tabulated. Enumerators are now uh, visiting about a half a million housing units and list enumerate areas in an operation similar to that initiated in Alaska on January 19th. Last week, we completed the service-based enumeration. Census enumerators interviewed people in shelters, at soup kitchens, mobile food stops, and at targeted outdoor lake locations. We enumerated about 22,000 such places over the course of three days. And we initiated the transient night operation, which will extend until April 14th for, very few, um, for a few very large and relatively stable locations. We have initiated and will continue through May 6th the count of about 7 million people in approximately 125,000 special places during group quarters enumeration, college and university dormitories, hospitals and prison wards, migrant farm camps, and nursing homes. We are on schedule with regard to the enumeration of land-based and shipboard military personnel and people aboard U.S. flag-bearing merchant vessels, about 1,000 ships and over 500 military reservations in all. In your letter of invitation, you ask about the status of data capture systems in all four sites. Data capture is working well. We have scanned about 25 million forms, and scanning accuracy is exceeding expectations. And as has been mentioned, we've received nearly 60,000 responses through the Internet. Questionnaire assistance centers opened on March 8th, will be open through April 14th. And to maximize use of staff, we eliminated redundant sites and currently have 24,000 in operation. Be counted forms became available on March 31 at approximately 19,000 sites in addition to the questionnaire assistance centers where they are also available. You also ask about any difficulties confronting local census offices. None of the 520 LCOs is today experiencing problems that have prevented normal, that are preventing normal operations. Some LCOs are reporting minor problems with their telephone systems and headquarters staff are working closely with the GSA and telecommunication service providers to resolve these problems. At present, all systems are up and running. Uh, as you know, uh, the non-response follow-up is scheduled to begin April 27th, with the numerator training beginning a few days earlier than that, and will continue for approximately 10 weeks until the first week of July. Extending NERFU beyond that date would not only increase census cost, it could lead to a reduction in data quality. Experience teaches us that the longer we are in the field and the further we get from census day, the more the quality of respondent answers deteriorate. We will stay in the field until we have exhausted all of our established procedures. You ask as well about the state of the hiring process uh, for NERFU. While we indeed have met our national goal of having 2.4 million qualified applicants well in advance of our April 19th target date, we are continuing to accept applications and we are actively recruiting in those few areas where we have not yet met our recruiting goals. I would like to describe in a bit more detail the enumerator's job and our procedures for assuring the quality and completeness of their work. Each uh, non-response follow-up enumerator is assigned a specific area in which to work, called an assignment area, and is given a binder of addresses in that area that includes all of those addresses for which we have not received a completed questionnaire. 
And in rural areas, enumerators are also given maps that have the housing unit location spotted on them. If the current household resident lived at the, uh, lived at the address on Census Day, the, interviewer, inter the enumerator interviews a household member at least 15 years of age and completes the assigned questionnaire. If the unit was a copy occupied by a different household on Census Day, the enumerator completes a questionnaire for the occupants who lived there on Census Day by interviewing a knowledgeable person such as a neighbor. If the current occupants were not enumerated elsewhere, the enumerator will also complete a questionnaire for them at their Census Day address. If the housing unit was vacant on Census Day, the enumerator completes appropriate housing questions on the questionnaire by interviewing a knowledgeable person such as a neighbor or apartment house manager. The enumerator must make up to six attempts to complete a questionnaire. If no one is home at an occupied housing unit, the enumerator obtains as much information as possible about how to contact the occupants from a neighbor, building manager, or other source. The enumerator also leaves a notice at the address that they have been visited and provides a telephone number so the occupant can call back. The enumerator will make up to two additional personal visits, three in all, and three telephone attempts at contacting the household before obtaining as much information as possible to complete the questionnaire from a knowledgeable source. Enumerators are instructed to make their callbacks on different days of the week and at different times of day. They are expected to complete, to obtain complete interviews, but must often, but must obtain at least the status, occupied or vac vacant, and the number of people living in the unit. If the enumerator submits a questionnaire that contains this minimal level of data, the crew leader must check the enumerator's record of callbacks for the housing unit to determine that procedures were properly followed. The crew leader also holds these cases for possible further follow-up to obtain more complete data. In order to prevent falsification of the data by enumerators, a percentage of each enumerator's work is verified for accuracy by a re-interview staff. An enumerator who has discovered falsifying data is dismissed immediately and all the work must be redone by another enumerator. Daily production levels begin to decrease toward the end of NERFU. Sometimes enumerators completed the easiest cases first, finished the work closest to their homes first, or believe that the quicker they finished their assignment, the sooner they would be out of work. In order to bring the NERFU to closure within schedule, we implement a procedure known as final attempt. Within the area covered by a crew later, approximately 2,200 cases, when that area has completed 95% of its workload, the crew leader consolidates the remaining work and gives it to the most productive and dependable enumerators. These enumerators then make one final visit to each outstanding address and to some of the housing units for which only minimal data was earlier collected to complete as much of the questionnaire as possible. This procedure takes advantage of our best enumerators and will improve both the count and the data quality. Final attempt must resolve all outstanding cases. NERFU is not over until every procedure has been completed and this, of course, includes the check-in of every census form. Let me then turn quickly in conclusion to the long-form issue. Mr. Chairman, I pledge to you in this subcommittee several meetings ago that I would bring to your attention any development which could put the census at risk. Nothing in our current operations poses such a risk, but the widespread attack on the long-form could have serious consequences. Indeed, I alerted you to this in our phone conversation early last week. First, a few background comments. Concern with overburdening respondents with too many questions led the Census Bureau to introduce a long form on a sample basis in the 1940 census. And we've used this approach in each decennial census since. The selection of a sample based on established scientific methods means that not everyone is asked every question. The large majority receive only the short form. Three, four more minutes. Oh, yeah. yep. We have plenty of time. Yep. The census 2000 long form is the shortest in history. The law requires that three years prior to Census Day, the Census Bureau report to Congress the subject proposed for inclusion in the census. The Census Bureau reported this information to Congress in a letter and company materials dated March 28, 1997. The law also requires that we report to Congress the specific questions we tend to ask two years prior. We did that in March 30th, 1998. The materials we submitted to Congress described each question we included on the long form and more importantly provided detailed legal citations that indicate that each item is mandated or required by congressional legislation or federal judicial decisions in the book that the ranking member has just, and indeed you referenced uh, as well. Accurate census data also provide the underpinnings for other federal surveys and data collections. The decennial census forms a sampling base for other national surveys and is used to compute rates of various indicators. Therefore, it is directly linked to the statistical system's ability to provide current unemployment data, 
to provide data for making cost of living adjustments, to calculate numerous vital statistics and rates for health services, to calculate crime, imprisonment, and victimization rates, and the like. I now bring the subcommittee up to date regarding our concerns about the fate of long-form data in the current census environment. Some of the information I now have available is so recent that I could not include it in the written testimony submitted earlier this week. The current differential response rate between the short and long-form households is approximately double the 1990 rate. This differential may close, and we are doing everything we can to assure the American people that long-form data are important and confidential. Every 5% differential in the response rate between the two forms translates into a 1% reduction in the overall response rate. In other words, if the differential today were what it was in 1990, the overall national response rate would be a percentage point higher. If the lower than expected response to the long form persists, there will be operational and budgetary implications. It takes more time to enumerate a long form. A lower than expected response rate will, consequently, place an unanticipated burden on the non-response follow-up phase of the census. Moreover, given the public atmosphere that has trivialized and discredited the long form, we have to be concerned about the morale of the field staff, who will now be trying to get information that many public voices, including a few members of Congress, are saying should be voluntary. We have to be prepared for higher than expected turnover, especially in rural areas with a higher than average number of long forms. Given the public commentary, there is also the possibility that we will have a higher than expected item non-response on the long form. This could have serious consequences for a decade. The Census Bureau has high quality standards. It would not release data that it believed were insufficiently reliable to perform the functions expected of them. This has never happened with census data, but it has with certain survey information. If the two issues just mentioned, high non-response to the long form and high non-compliance with particular items on the form's return, combine to push data below our quality threshold, the Census Bureau would be placed in a very difficult position of deciding what to release. Mr. Chairman, I know you are concerned about whether the ACE will provide the quality of data required to adjust for the undercount. At a public session organized by the National Academy of Sciences, I said that if the ACE effort did not meet Census Bureau quality standards, it would not be used. This principle holds for all Census Bureau efforts. If, for instance, the income data were to fall below our quality threshold and we could not release it, more than two dozen statutory uses, ranging from the Energy Policy Act of 1992 to the Business and Industry Guaranteed Low Program of 1980 to Title I funds and Head Start programs would be affected. So also would be the calculation of the Consumer Price Index and the unemployment rate for the next decade. You, Mr. Chairman, and the Ranking Member, and Mr. Ryan, Mr. Davis, have made strong statements about the importance of the long-form data. But now I urge you to ask the entire United States Congress to step forward and explain to the American people why the Congress has required, authorized, and paid for the collection of these long-form data. There were no viable alternatives to having a long-form for Census 2000. No other data source could provide all the information the nation needs in a cost-effective manner. But in the long term, we hope that the American Community Survey will replace the long form, and indeed by Census 2010. The American Community Survey, scheduled for nationwide implementation in 2003, is one of the most important improvements in federal statistics, and it is the cornerstone of our effort to keep pace with ever-increasing demands for timely and relevant data. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have uh, two votes coming up, and so um, uh, I think we should be back in about 15 minutes. So um, we'll stand in recess until we complete the next vote. So ask my colleagues to come back as soon as we can, and we'll proceed. reconvene the uh, committee, uh, subcommittee. Let me start off with some questions on uh, the uh, long form. 
Um, Could you, what is the difference in response rates in 1990 between long form and short form and also in the dress rehearsal? The, um, between the long form and short form, yeah. yeah. The long form, short form differential in 1990 uh, at the end of the census was 4.5%. Uh, but at the end of mail out, mail back, it was about 6%. And the reason that converged slightly is that when we go out in the field, we were able to convert a higher percentage of the long-form non-respondents than the short-form non-respondents. Um, so that that, so you actually closed the gap a little bit in, in, 19, uh, in 1990. Um, and then uh, your numbers that I just saw in your testimony on the, uh, the dress rehearsal range from, from uh, uh, 10 to 15 percent. It was uh, Sacramento and, I mean, the, I don't think... Uh, the Sacramento and South, South Carolina. Yeah, what were they again? I think there was... Okay, I've got, I've just oh. got it now. Sacramento was... 14.7 uh, and 11.2. 12 percent, and um, that's South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. The reason it's complicated, sir, is that we have both, we calculated both mail-out, mail-back area and also update leave area. Um, so the, the, the... Update leave area was 13 percent. The mail out mail back was 11 percent for South Carolina. The differential in Sacramento for mail out mail back was 15, and in Menominee was 8. That was all update leave, of course. Yeah. Menominee yeah. would not be a good. Uh, no, it's comparison. all update leave. Right, right, right. Uh. Um, um, so that those are the as best those are the now the numbers right. Yep. So the, uh, the the dress rehearsal gave us an indication of a problem which we just really found out about a year ago and was at that time it was really too late to really respond to it as much. I mean it was you know it did or did did what what steps did the bureau do when the well I I, I would say that uh, certain things the uh, the dress rehearsal gives you a clue on uh, the the as you know the overall. Turnout uh, response rate in dress rehearsal was way below what we expected and what we are getting in 2000. The dress rehearsal doesn't predict everything. The dress rehearsal is an opportunity for us to test operations. We don't expect the overall response patterns in a dress rehearsal outside the census environment to look like the overall response rate. So we would not ourselves have concluded that that differential was very predictive. We think the strongest predictor of 2000 uh, large scale patterns is the 1990 pattern. Uh, indeed, uh, one of the most interesting things um, is that the overall response rate in 1990 compared to 1980 tracks almost perfectly across the 50 states. It's just that everybody dropped 10 percent. It's not that some states dropped 20 percent and some states didn't drop at all. It's that all of them dropped approximately 10 percent across the entire country. So, so that's the strongest predictor. That's why we based uh, much of our operations uh, on the 1990 response rates for 2000. We can't, the, 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 there's so many things going on in a dress rehearsal. One, they're, they're not necessarily typical places of the entire country. It seemed like it just, I mean, there was a fairly high non-response. I mean, the, there was a large differential. I mean, you don't think that was significant then in, in both Sacramento or? Uh, well, I only uh, say, uh, no, we, d we didn't conclude from that that we were likely to get this kind of differential in, in 2000 at all. No, we just didn't. Uh, but neither did the subcommittee or the GAO or any of our, nobody sort of said, oh, my goodness, at that mm -hmm. stage. Yeah. Um, how do you, when you, when people, you, you scan in, is it the envelopes that you basically yep. scan in, that's how you know, and then the, the scanning car, barcode tells you whether it's a long form or short form, the computer would know. You don't know whether the person completed just the first six oh. questions or long. You won't know that for months from now. That is true. We will do serious work on, as I say, item non-response. Mm -hmm. That is the completion of the form. Uh, but we won't have serious data on that until uh, winter of, of 2001. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was uh, talking to actually another member of Congress. He had a form with him. He has a long form. And he um, um, was still completing it. And so, I mean... It just takes longer to com yes. complete. I remember when I, I got the long form, as I think I mentioned to you, and so there were some questions that my wife, I wanted her to fill out because she knew more details on a couple of the specifics. And so it just took longer to do that. The short form is obviously anybody can go through in a matter of a couple of minutes right. and complete it. Uh, so there, there could be a delay a little bit, so we'll have to see what it is, but oh, I, I, a little we, longer. You know. We very much hope there is a delay. Yeah. We hope that people yeah. are sitting with a long form waiting and that this, this, uh, that this converges as the rates converge. I would, however, point out that if you sort of do the arithmetic, 
Um, there aren't that many forms left out there we expect to get back in the mail. You know, at a certain point, you begin to get a real tailing off of the, of the mail back uh, uh, experience. We're still hoping for another weekend effect. That is, we're hoping that this forthcoming weekend, we're just doing a lot of heavy advertising right now to try to get everyone to do it. And it's certainly possible, as you suggest, uh, Mr. Miller, that more long forms are sitting on those kitchen counters than short forms. And therefore, we'll get a dispro disproportionate number of long forms uh, at the tail end. And we will be very happy if that turns out to be the case. But we will know that roughly a week from today. Ms. Maloney. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Pruitt, I, I, think the contra I think the controversy over the long form that has surfaced uh, has, has been uh, quite harmful to your efforts. Uh, what do you think is the impact on the response rate because of these comments by elected officials? Uh, I honestly believe that um, it's very difficult for large parts of the American public to draw the kind of fine distinctions that are sometimes suggested in public commentary. Um, I, I, I appreciate that uh, all responsible leaders are saying uh, it's important to be counted. Therefore, send your form in even if you don't fill it all out. But uh, how that translates in uh, the public consciousness, especially we're now dealing, with, we've all got to remember, is we're now dealing with the tail end of the mail back response period. That is, the, the most uh, alert and responsible and committed uh, members of the society have probably sent their form back in. So we're now dealing with people who are maybe less motivated or less attuned or paying less attention. So what they may hear kind of just vibrating in the atmosphere is, oh, well, uh, the, the information is not that important after all. That's what has us worried, quite honestly. What are, what are you doing to counter this unfortunate attitude do you we have are, any uh, uh, plans to specifically respond to the unfortunate comments of uh, Senator Lott and, and Governor Bush? I have, um, I have done everything I can uh, in, in the media uh, uh, to uh, repeat that the long-form questions are all there uh, because the U.S. Congress wants them, that they all perform these important functions, as, as all of you have, have already testified and have said in your own uh, PSAs. Um, and that uh, all we can do is simply repeat that mantra. We're doing a lot of targeted advertising right now as best we can, video news feeds. I do about uh, 10 or 15 a day into different markets where we think we'll be able to get a bit of, 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 of visibility on this. We're uh, accelerating our radio, targeted radio advertising uh, right now. But there's, we're very, it's very late in the game to try to use an advertising campaign to uh, counter the, uh, the, the, the mindset or the public uh, impression that has been generated by, uh, and I, I think as the chairman says quite correctly, a, um, uh, a, a quite extensive uh, uh, attention to this issue among talk show uh, and other public commentators. Uh, when I say public commentators, I certainly don't mean at all to exclude uh, any of the, the larger, the newspaper editors and so forth, are all part of that commentary. All we can do at this stage is, uh, uh, is push hard in this last three or four or five days. But if I could just say one other word, I, I, I think it's going to be extremely important, extremely important when the mail-out, mail-back period is finished, which is, after all, less than a week, to regroup on this and try to get a message out because the non-response follow-up period is we're going to have a lot of temporary employees who are not trained enumerators. They are Americans going out to try to count America, and they're going to be out in the field knocking on doors, and it's very important to have an atmosphere at that time that this census matters, that this is serious business, uh, and that this is not trivial or incidental or voluntary or anything like that. So I'm very much hopeful that we will be able to, with your help, I'm sure, enlist the United States Congress on that behalf, but other members of the U.S. government to say in that key period, after all, we may have as many as another 40, 45 million households to get the information from. So the census is far from over. So we have another shot at trying to make a major message. Uh, but we will not be able to do that through an advertising campaign. We will have to do that with the kind of PSAs that you just saw, in which I hope the next round they will stress the importance, as, as Congressman Ryan just stressed, uh, of the importance of these data and to cooperate with the enumerators. Well, I must say that uh I've collected well over 30 editorials across the country, really calling upon everyone 
to fill out their forms, the long form, and not to listen to any elected official who may be advocating otherwise or referring to the census long form as uh, optional. It occurs to me that, uh, that the problem may surface after the non-response, uh, after the mail ba back, but in the non-response follow-up. It may be even more of a problem there. At what point do you send an enumerator out once you have the long form? Um, do all of the questions have to be answered? Or what, what is the decision if, if they do just selectively answer? Do you still send out an enumerator? What is the procedure in that no. case? No, if we get a, a, a long form in uh, that has any information whatsoever on it, any information that allows us to, to consider it a, a legitimate response, uh, then we cannot send a numerator out to try to get the additional information. That simply has to be. That's why I say item non-response is a very serious issue, but we don't have a good measure of item non-response. Item non-response can be, you know, three questions that were left blank, or they can be 52 questions that were left blank. We certainly have to have some information. Um, for example, we cannot take a form that says there are um, 99 people living here and then nothing else. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we can't accept that form on behalf of the United States government. Mm -hmm. We would have to somehow find out uh, if there were really people living there. So there are certain thresholds below which we simply can't accept the form, obviously. And you wouldn't want us to. Uh, that would be, uh, it would be an alert to us that perhaps this is a fraudulent count. So uh, we have to get enough information to know that somebody actually lives there, that this is a, a, a residence, it's an inhabited residence, and enough information about an individual to be able to say this is a person, else we can't put them in the count. But no, we, we certainly do not have the resources uh, to go out and now convert all of a lot of empty responses on the long form into full data. We, we, that's not part of the census operational plan. The time is up. <laughs> we'll be doing another round. Mr. Ryan. Um, Dr. Pruitt. I'm just curious. You, you said that the non-response follow-up for or the non-response for the long form is twice what it was in 1990 at this time. At this time, why do you think that is? I'm just curious. What what do you think it is aside from comments here and there? Why do you think that is? Uh, look, I, I I I I'm actually trying to get some information on this, uh, uh, and I I can speculate the way you can speculate. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, Congressman Ryan, that this country has a heightened sense of privacy concerns, and that spills over into the into the government. I can tell you, based upon some survey data, that the um, the proportion of the American public who was telling us that the census data are invasive, this is not confidential, that they are invasive, jumped by seven percent from week two of the census to week three of the census. And in between that period of time, that's when this campaign started. So I, I can only infer from that that it's having some effect. Now, does that then translate into non-response? I can't tell you that yet. That's a very complicated issue. Yeah, no, that, I just wanted your speculation. Sure. Uh, a court, I think it was a Houston judge, if I'm not mistaken, uh, filed an injunction against the imposition of a fine uh, for those who may not fill out all of their long form. Um, what's your reaction to that? And in 1990, did the Census Bureau impose the $100 fine on people who at that time didn't fill out every bit of their long form questions? What's the history of, of the imposition of this fine? Um, what's your take on this injunction? Uh, the, uh, the, the last case that, the, uh, that was uh, enforced on noncompliance with, with the census was in 1960. Um, uh, Mr. Rickerbacker, uh, the fine was imposed. It was upheld uh, by the courts. Um, the Census Bureau itself, of course, is not an enforcement agency, would never do enforce any of these things. Uh, we're not an enforcement agency or you know, we're just a statistical agency. Right. Um, but it's not been our recommendation that enforcement action uh, take place. Uh, my own concern on that would be that that would create yet more right. noise, more fuel, more, and, and I would worry about the, that it have a damaging effect on the census. Uh, by the way, the, uh, the $100, which has been uh, frequently mentioned in the press, indeed we've mentioned it ourselves, I don't mean to uh, want to correct the record here, turns out to be up to $5,000. Uh, the Criminal Act of 1984, the standard uh, Criminal Act of 1984, trumps all other acts. It's Title 18, I believe. And unless you actually explicitly exclude some, p some federal infraction, 
uh, from the, uh, the law of Title 18, the fine is actually up to $5,000. Let me, let me get this straight. That I thought it was $5,000 if, if a government employee misuses the census data or accesses it improperly. That's a separate issue. That's That's sep you're $5, saying, so the fine is actually $5,000 if, um, if to, someone, up to $5,000, but... Um, well, this is the Uniform Criminal Statute passed in 1984 um, that basically, as I understand it, says that any infraction uh, of, a federal, of a federal law uh, can be, can illicitly fine up to $5,000. So the particular uh, uh, injunction against the 100 is targeted on the wrong, wrong piece of legislation. I it's see. on Title 13 rather than Title 18. Oh, that's so the injunction really is meaningless. Um, right. And 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 in, and an infraction subject to the $5,000 fine could be failure to fill out one or two of the questions on the long form. Yes, the the law does say you're oh. supposed to. Complete. I hate. To, I don't want to create some hysteria on talk radio with this. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, C-SPAN will play that. Uh, but, but you, let's just get this straight. The Census Bureau, I know you don't do the enforcement, but these fines have not been imposed in the since past. Since 1960. Since 1960. They weren't imposed in 70. They weren't imposed in 80. They weren't imposed in 90. I, I, I could be wrong in 70. I think maybe there was a case in 70 in which the, the, uh, the I think I'm almost certain now, there was a case in 70 which was overturned. Uh, that is, there was Enforcement Act, and it was overturned on grounds it was selective enforcement. How did, why did you choose that person instead of this person? when, you know, millions or hundreds of people sort of been, uh, created the, uh, uh, performed the infraction. So I think there was a case, but the only one which was upheld was 1960. Okay, so the, la so the last case was one that was thrown out because of yes, selective I think, enforcement. Yes, I think that's a 1970 case. But the Census Bureau itself uh, is not interested in pursuing uh, uh, enforcement action. And I understand that it's probably not in your best interest to, to pr broadcast that because then you'll encourage people not to fill these things out. But um, that's, boy, that's an intriguing number. Um, let me just ask you one more quick question. <clears throat> as your enumerators are going out, and I know you just addressed this a little bit with, with Mrs. Maloney, as your enumerators are going out and following up for the long form, as they ans ask questions on the follow-up for the long form, is there a threshold in the questioning that is acceptable and then not acceptable? Meaning, if, if you find that, that people are not going to answer a question, you know, this A, B, or C, but they will answer all other questions. Is there a threshold that you have established within the long form for your enumerators that makes it an acceptable uh, census or an unacceptable census? Is that, has that threshold been no, established? Certainly, no, there's certainly a, a minimal threshold, and the minimal threshold is we have to be able to be certain that the number of people we're counting in this household on this block actually live in that household. That's the, that's the threshold. Okay. So essentially, the, the short form questions and then the if, if we got, yes, even not all of the short form questions, if we got a, okay. a, 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 even a partial short form question answer on a long form, the person would still be counted. Okay. So we would have huge item non response. We would have all these other implications, but we would not lose the count. Okay. And we will do everything we can to get that count correct. Okay. Well, I see my time yep. has expired. Thank you, Dr. Pruitt. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Pruitt, I know that there's been and continues to be a tremendous amount of discussion about the uh, long form and, and the response. I do believe that, that people began to feel that it was more invasive as they heard other people suggest that it was invasive. I mean, the power of suggestion is amazing still in this country. And I don't think people were concerned as much about whether or not it was invasive until they began to hear public figures suggest that maybe it was, or they saw some columnists suggest that maybe it was, they pick it up and say, yeah, I guess it really is, I, when they look at it. Well, let me just ask you, let's, let's say that I am one of these individuals who want to participate in the count, and I don't have any real difficulty given the basic information. But I, too, have been convinced, if I was that person, and I received a long form, and I was not convinced. As a matter of fact, I did half of it. My wife did the other half. And then there might have been a question or two, and we threw up a coin to decide which one of us would answer that one. And uh, it was done. A lot of fun. 
but but let's say <laughs> that 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 I am not convinced that the information is necessary and that I can participate without providing this information. Is there something that one might be able to suggest or convey to the average citizen that it is important to do the long form if that's what they got? Well, I think, uh, uh, Congressman Davis, that the um the message is roughly the message that we have been trying to promote now for, you know, for uh, six months, which is an awful lot of government programs, benefits to your community. You know, if you see those ads about schools or you see those ads about transportation or you see those ads about health services or daycare center, you're, I, I think if you make any kind of connection at all, you connect that to long-form data because obviously all of the social programs and including uh, privately pro provided programs by charities and churches and so forth use the kind of data about age, about veteran status, about poverty, um, about uh, traffic congestion, about water pollution and so forth based upon long-form data to provide those services. So I would hope that the that when you're sitting there at the table say, well, I know this is uh, you know something I don't particularly want to do, but my goodness, I've just heard that all these benefits will come to my community. You'll make that you'll make that sort of logical step. Um, and but at this stage, what we will have to do, because if we do have a higher than expected non-response to to the long form, uh, we will now have to try to get the enumerators. And this is not easy. You're now trying to train roughly a half a million uh, of, of temporary workers who are not your professional enumerators, temporary workers, to, to go against people who are angry at you, indifferent to you, hostile towards you, what have you, and get that full information. Uh, we will have to rely on that, on that army of people. Uh, we will have to get them to understand the importance of this. This will not recapture the data that has already come in, but is incompletely filled out. There's no way to recapture that data at this stage. Are you saying that this is information that can be used for planning purposes to help make specific determinations about what is needed in certain communities or what might be needed overall for the country as a whole? Well, uh, yes, sir. I think uh, to, to put this as strong as I can, um, I think the, the, uh, the commentators thus far overlooking the fact that the consumer price index, uh, the unemployment rates, are tracked with data that in turn are dependent upon quality information that you get from the decennial and that we are now putting at risk the way in which we conduct our basic, basic economic statistics in this country. That's a very, this is very serious stuff. Would you also say that there is no better way or no other time at which we could expect to get this information in such a massive way? There certainly is no way in, in, in the year 2000, uh, that is the, uh, there is no agency other than the Census Bureau that can collect this kind of information. It's not if we can suddenly decide, oh, well, let's go find somebody else and collect long-form data in, for the country on some sort of sample basis. Uh, we're actually still trying to do the census, so we wouldn't be able to do it. The best we could offer the country, and it's not trivial, is that if we were to, the, the chairman is open to remarks, said that he does not expect, this Congress does not expect, to be doing the long-form data ever again the way we're doing it this year. And holding out the possibility, which, uh, which I'm delighted to hear, that we will be able to launch the American Community Survey. We're currently scheduled to launch that in 2003. Um, we could actually accelerate that by a year. We could start the American Community Survey a year earlier if the Congress instructed us. They have to instruct us right away. But if they told us to start planning to be in the field by 2002 with the American Community Survey, we believe we could do it. I noticed that the initial response rate for my state, Illinois, is 56 percent, but I'm told that my city is significantly lower than that. Uh, would you have any suggestions at this late date for, for, for those places that are coming in below the national norm? Yeah. The, um, the most important figure to watch right now is how far below your own performance in 1990 you were. And in Chicago, uh, you're about 13 percent below your 1990 performance. Uh, that is not that far off from the national number. The national number is, after all, about 10 percent. 
So it's not, it's not a, even though you're well below the national average, the most important thing is to be measuring yourself against 1990. So the most important message to get to the people of Chicago is let's accomplish what we accomplished in 1990. Don't worry about the national average. Don't worry about the fact that Wisconsin and Nebraska are high. Worry about what we were in 1990 and how we can get there. It's not too late to send the form in. Uh, we're now doing video news feeds to Chicago, among other places, saying it's not too late, it's not too late. Mail it back now if you still have it. And I think the more we can get that message out over the next two or three days, the better off the census will be. We're well, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, and, you know, I'm so pleased that I've got a bunch of volunteers who are also going out this weekend just simply knocking on doors, asking people to send good, the forms Good, 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 good. Uh, Director Pruitt, as, as you know, I've been encouraging everybody to complete all the questions in it. And I think Mr. Ryan has, and certainly the, the overwhelming majority of everybody here in Congress, uh, because we recognize how critical it is for our area. If my area, Manti or Sarasota, is undercounted, it hurts. It's Chicago or New York City. So it really is a personal thing that we need to do. Uh, when Mr. Ryan was asked a question about why people are not uh, responding, and you, you're referring to some poll that's saying, well, it was really because of some comments of the Andy Rooney's or politicians or something like that or all the talk show people. Uh, but you know, I, I've heard you talk. I mean, there are legitimate concerns about privacy that are probably different today than they were 10 years ago. The Internet issue, whether it's medical privacy, we're fi fighting this medical privacy issue, uh, the fighting the uh, financial privacy is always a subject that we're in concern with, and we have legitimate concern. And there have been some abuses, and I mentioned in my opening statement about a driver's license problem in Florida. They were selling the photographs even in Florida. Um, and so people are more suspect, uh, suspect of government on the trust issue, and I think you have, you know, said that publicly too, right? I mean, it's, so it's not just these oh. comments. I mean, you know, you know, oh, no, there yeah. are differences. Yes, sir. Let me, I, I, yes, sir. I don't want I don't to back away from that at all. What I've said publicly and, and uh, certainly repeat strongly today, I think this country is on a collision course between its insatiable desire for information and its heightened concern about privacy. And the Census Bureau is caught between those two needs. As I said yesterday publicly to the press, uh, we are turning a corner and creating a knowledge economy. And the infrastructure for a knowledge economy is information. And the decennial base helps create a higher quality information infrastructure for this society. And the society, on the one hand, wants that. On the other hand, we have these deep concerns about, about privacy. Um, all I was suggesting by the poll data, and I don't want to put too much emphasis on poll data, I, I really don't, but as I saw it jump you know, in a week, it isn't that it wasn't already there, it was there, but it jumped in one week that the census data themselves are invasive. And that happened to be the week when this became a, a public discussion. I just, that's just a fact. Uh, I don't want to overinterpret it, but it is a fact. But there are but, legitimate concerns about oh, the privacy. I think if we polled it today compared to 19, 10 years ago. It, it would and be I think higher. we need to, you know, you're right, we're in an information technology era, and uh, this raises these concerns. And I think, as I say, we're going to have hearings later on this summer. Um, after we get through these critical phases to discuss how to handle the 2010 census. Let me ask another question. I know you've been asked this before is if someone, you know, refuses to answer the income question and they don't, I mean, I've heard you on talk shows, you get asked this question. I mean, what do you tell someone? You tell them basically, what, what do you tell, what do you tell someone? Says, well, I'm not going to put my information down about how much my electric bill is or how my income is. What do you tell that well, person? Well, if, if I were one-on-one -on -one with a, with a respondent in that situation, I would say, look, Make, make a, you know, give us an estimate, uh, create a range, give us the best information you're prepared to give us. Uh, I would certainly say here are the kind of ways in which this information is used. Uh, and as I just said, the, the, it's, it's over two dozen pieces of important federal legislation use some the income data one way or the other. So the, the, the array of programs is enormous that, that use these data. But it's also used to drive the sample frame and the statistical controls for the CPI and the unemployment data. All of our pension systems are indexed to the CPI. The Social Security is indexed to the CPI. The stakes are very high. That's what I would try to explain. If they nevertheless persisted in refusing, I would, I would prefer to get their information, whatever I could get from them. As I say, the most important thing, and I don't underestimate this, the most important thing is a good count. Our constitutional obligation is to count the population for purposes of apportionment and redistricting. We take that as our foremost first priority task. And the other benefits that come from the long form are simply not as high a priority. So we will do everything we can to count everyone and make sure we don't count anyone twice and that we have no fraudulent responses. And that's our first 
first task. And, and you also, in response to Mr. Ryan, you said you're, you're not an enforcement agency. I mean, you know, we want everybody to complete it. I mean, right. we, we want to, we all convey that. But I mean, as you said, you're not an enforcement agency and, you know, yeah, we're certainly not, right, we're not going to tell our enumerators to go weigh fines in front of these people <laughs> right. at all. Right. Uh, we did put on the envelope the fact this was required by law. We did that for two reasons. We wanted to make sure this didn't look like junk mail, and no one else has the right to put that on the envelope, if you think about it for a moment. We were worried that, that, that other people might sort of try to duplicate the census mailing, as indeed we had one instance of. Um, and indeed, uh, that, that mailing must have worked a little bit because we got some checks made out to that organization uh, at the... Uh, <laughs> what do you do with that? We sent them right to the organization. We actually did not. We sent them back to the, uh, to the respondent. We didn't want to ourselves be in the uh, banking business of handling money for uh, uh, Mr. Glavin. Uh, and, uh, uh, as you might appreciate. Uh, uh, but, but no, we actually did get uh, uh, some, some responses to that mailing. But by putting the mandatory nature on the envelope, we were certain that, uh, that nobody else could duplicate the envelope and try to piggyback on the census environment. So that was the reason one. The other reason is that we have some research that suggests that slightly increases the response. And so we wanted to use everything we could to get the response rate up. Did you ever get anyone set, that sent a you know, $100 in, so I'm not going to refuse to send this, <laughs> and send you a check? Oh, yes. We have, we have uh, certified letters that come in with $100 saying, I want to pay my fine. I don't want to, I'm not going to do your and questionnaire. They have, but their check has their address. And their oh, right, 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 <laughs> so. right. Oh, yeah. So we, listen, the number of things we get, you would be surprised. Uh, the other day, we, I'm sorry, I, I can't resist this anecdote. Uh, we opened up a, a, a form. There were seven $100 bills in it. And we, obviously, somebody simply made a mistake. They w had stuff on their desk, and they ended up putting $700. We found that person less than 24 hours and had returned the money to them. I was very proud of our organization <laughs> at, at that stage. Ms. Maloney. That's a, that's a good uh, story to tell from your, from, from your agency. At, at our last hearing, we had quite an extensive discussion on access by various agencies to the Census Bureau. I understand that many of these issues have been worked out, but that there are ongoing conversations with the monitoring board. I've also heard that there's been some confrontation between um, oversight personnel and Census Bureau personnel. And I understand there was some threatening comments. Uh, could you explain what happened and comment fur further on access and in particular this particular incident? Uh, yes. No, I am pleased to, to report that we have been making some headway. Uh, and with the, with the chairman's permission and your permission, uh, uh, the deputy director has taken a, a major leadership responsibility in working out the access questions. So if I could ask him to, to respond to where we are on access issues. Great. Mm -hmm. Mr. Barron. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let's see if I can uh, remember the question from walking three steps forward. Um, yeah, we've spent a lot of time, Ms. Maloney, since the last hearing on access issues. Uh, I think the major objective was to make, on our part, was to make sure that we were providing the access that all the various oversight entities uh, felt they needed in order to do their job. Uh, right now, we are at, I think, 140 visits, either conducted or scheduled now through the end of uh, April. I fully expect that number is going to grow some more. Um, to my knowledge, we are working well with all those who wish to uh, uh, look at our activities. Um, and if there are any complaints, I hope people will get in touch with me right away. Um, with respect to the issue of uh, threatening comments, I think we did have uh, reports of, uh, of one incident uh, in one LCO. Um, I've discussed that with the uh, monitoring board staff. I think uh, they agreed with me that this was a situation um, that needed to be addressed. And in fact, um, some guidelines on conduct, uh, which emphasize uh, that in the course of doing these visits, uh, federal employees and the LCO staff need to be treated with courtesy and respect. I think that's mentioned several times in those guidelines, and you know, I'd like to thank the, the congressional side of the monitoring board for preparing that document and sort of putting this issue uh, to rest. Um, just in conclusion, I think given the tone of uh, 
some of the comments made at the last hearing, I think this was the reason the Census Bureau had our guidelines in the first place. We have a temporary staff um, working for us for just a short period of time. They're a wonderful group of people. We give them a lot of work to do. And we were just trying to manage the process by which people contact them. And I think over the last month we've made a lot of progress and I'm hoping others agree and we can just both go about uh, doing the work we all need to do. Very well. Uh, Dr. Pruitt, uh, what is your response to the chairman's comment that he would like to do away with the long form in 2010? Uh, well, I, I did obviously um, uh, note that response or that comment. Mr. Uh, Put your microphone. I'm oh, sorry. Please. Um, no, I, I did, of course, uh, note that, and, and I, I, I agree with the chairman. Uh, I think, as the chairman knows, the Census Bureau has, for now several years, uh, been uh, working toward establishing the American Community Survey. Uh, the, the Congress has, has funded this uh, early pre preparatory work. We're in the field right now with the American Community Survey because we have to see if the, uh, if, the, if the questions bridge, if the data bridges in an intelligent way between the American Community Survey format and the, um, and the long form format in the decennial. Uh, we are coming before the Appropriations Committee tomorrow. Uh, we will be recommending in our 2001 budget the continuation of that work. I do not see any alternative right now to the long form other than the American Community Survey. Um, I think the, uh, some of the ideas that have been uh, mentioned in public that we ought to just simply assign this task to each of the agencies to do their own individual surveys would not be a very efficient way to conduct the government's business. So I do think the American Community Survey remains by far the most innovative and important way to get the kind of data the country needs, not just the federal government, but that the country needs in a timely fashion and to do it in a somewhat different environment. Um, the questions I should say um, uh, to um, uh, the committee are no less intrusive. They are still the same questions unless the, the U.S. Congress decides we shouldn't be asking these questions, which is fair enough, we then won't ask them. But they are still intrusive, but we believe that in a, in a, in a sample format in which you're only talking to about a quarter million of people per month, but you're rolling that through uh, the, uh, the, the full year and then the next year and the next year, that you have the opportunity to do more education about the importance of these, of these questions with the local leaders. I think when the, uh, the important thing about the American Community Survey is it's conceptualized to be deeply rooted in the local communities. And when the local leaders understand these are important data for us, then we hope that they will be out front in making the case uh, and that that will create a public education environment and we will get high levels of, of cooperation. Although I uh, was not a member of Congress in 1990, I was a member of the City Council in New York and was very involved in the census and involving partnerships with the community and, and working with other Congress members to get the response rate up. I don't recall any, any type of, uh, of objection or conflict at all over the long form in 1990, and the form that we are we have before us now is essentially the same, only four questions less. You mentioned there was a a disparity between the short form and the long form after the second week. Is that correct? No. What I was talking about some uh, some survey data that survey uh, the response rate coming back. Oh, in. oh the response rate. The response no. rate coming right. back. The response in. rate after, issue after the controversy. The response rate fell for the long form? Uh, no, I, I uh, actually we haven't tracked this day by day. Uh, I, I don't know as we would put much confidence, even if that were the case, in that fact, because I think, as the chairman says correctly, we, we expect people to hold the long form longer and to be, uh, to be delayed in returning it. So the, what we're focused upon is the end point. Um, if, we, if we don't close this, what is now roughly a 12 percent gap uh, in the long form and the short form, then, as I say, operationally, we have more work to do, and we also have the problem of data quality, serious problem with data quality if we don't get those, those data. So uh, the most important indicator, I think, uh, of, of whether the campaign has had an effect will be an item non-response. That is, if we have millions of long forms which have come in, but there's not much on them, and if that is a huge drop-off or even a significant drop-off from 1990, then we would be able to infer from this that obviously the, uh, the, the conversation, as, as Mr. Davis just said, the kind of suggestive nature of arguing invasiveness will have had an effect, and the country will actually pay a price for a decade unless we get the American Community Survey up 
uh, quite quickly uh, and start sort of filling in the gaps. Um, it, it's, I, I just, it is serious stuff, uh, and I, I'm just concerned that people don't understand how, how, what's at stake when you're talking about the CPI and Social Security payments. Mm -hmm. um, to say nothing of Title I and Head Start and Clean Air and uh, all of the other programs, the, the mm -hmm. dozens and dozens and dozens of programs. Um, but as I've said publicly, um, I, 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 I think that the capacity of, of, of Mr. Greenspan to report to this Congress on the state of the economy uh, is, is, becomes an issue if we have very flawed uh, long-form data. My time is up. So. Is there an organized campaign against the long form, you think, or is it just, I mean, there's really these, a lot of talk show people are going after it, I think. I, but it's not an organized effort to do it. I don't well, uh, look, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not, not a aware conspiracy of theorist. Uh, I, I would say I've certainly heard the leaders of the Libertarian Party. Uh, and if you think of that as an organization, it is an organization. Uh, from my email traffic, that when you start getting the same email time and time again, it mm -hmm. suggests that, you know, it's not just random. Um, and when you hear the same sort of things in the talk shows and so forth, it is certainly an environment in which it's easier to kind of create a, a, a buzz of, of in, in the public discourse about something. Mm -hmm. Because of the internet chat rooms, we have people who sort of track the chat rooms, uh, and there's a lot of it in, in, in that. We have, there are internet sites out there. All of those kinds of things exist which simply didn't exist in the And Andy Rooney, who's not considered a conservative, uh, <laughs> came out saying he's not going to do it. Let me, let me switch to, this is more local with me, if you don't mind. Uh, in Sarasota, uh, in my area, Sarasota, I think it was 58% as of yesterday or so, so I was rather pleased that my uh, main county is. But the Complete count, count Committee has received hundreds of calls from people who have not received a census questionnaire. These are communities with, these are not communities with new housing units. There have been reports in the Washington Post that local areas, parts of D.C. and the entire uh, city of Oquaquan, Maryland has not received their forms. How is the Bureau addressing these serious problems and what can these people do to make sure they get counted? Um, well, obviously, every time we get a report that some area of the country has not received forms, we immediately go to work on that and uh, do various kinds of things. Depends. If, for example, we get a report that these areas got their advance letter and also got their reminder card but did not get a form, then that's not anything at fault with our master address file. For some reason, the post office simply did not mail the form. They mailed the advance letter and mailed the postcard, but not the form. So we hope that those forms are sitting someplace in a post office and they're still in the mail stream and they will get there. But where you have a situation where no one got any piece of mail, um, then that suggests that there was a, uh, that there was a, a, a mail address uh, a problem. And if that is in new construction, we have now finished our new construction work. I think the, the number of addresses we're adding is? 385? What? Yeah, about 375,000 addresses are added through the, uh, the new construction uh, uh, process, and they will all be enumerated in the non-response follow-up period. So we actually first sir, try to figure out what, what is the nature of the problem before we figure out how to fix it. Uh, we still are depending upon telephone assistance centers. You can still order a form uh, up until April 11th by using that number. We widely publicize that number. We sometimes go out and deliver them ourselves if we have reason to believe that it was something, was a breakdown in our system. We're not finding many instances where it's a breakdown in our system. Sometimes it's a slippage between the uh, post office box problem where we, we cannot deliver questionnaires to a post office box right. because that's not, an ad it's not a geocoded geo address. And so some of the instances that we're picking up in the press in other ways are, are those kinds of four instances. But we, we do not ignore any of those. Every one of those things that is brought to our attention, we immediately, through our local uh, census offices, uh, immediately go to work in that neighborhood and see if we can sort of sort out the sort of the nature of the problem and, and correct it. Uh, I know there's a little area called Laurel in the southern part of Sarasota County or the central part of the county that said they weren't counted in 1990. I mean, we're sending a letter to make sure that you know, people yep. are aware that they will be followed up on and yep. such. Though, so there is a concern. Um, talking about Florida. Um, we have a lot of seasonal people, and I, you know, it's like Longboat Key. I mean, it is, is an incorporated area, so it has a separate set of numbers, for example. Uh, but I have large mobile home parks, and these people are only there for six months of the year. Uh, first of all, some people feel they should be counted half in each city. I mean, they feel, which in a way, I mean, if I live six months in Michigan, six months in Florida, I mean, you know, we have road you know, needs and other needs because of the people being down there, emergency services and all that. So they felt, so they're arguing that they should get counted half and half. But uh, one of the problems is, 
I, and it's, uh, in a way, I wish there was a way to have it on the form. Like I get a form here in Washington. You have a place here in Washington. You know, you temporarily live in, and you don't, you know, you fill out your form in in your home, and I fill out my form in Florida. But what members do is just throw them away because they say it doesn't apply. But it means now that you're going to have to send an enumerator to go knock on that door. Yes, it does. And so, you know, it's like other. I've talked to some other members. They say, well, I got my form in Washington. I just threw it away because it doesn't tell you what to do with it. Right. And it's, it's unfortunate there wasn't a way to check a box that this is your second home. And I can see this in, like, Longboat Key had a response rate, I think, as of yesterday, of 36%. Well, Longboat Key probably got a, if 100% of the people that live there returned it, you'd only have a 50% response rate because 100% of the units, as, as you know, because it's a tourist area. Or you can go to Colony Cove, a large mobile home park in my area, would have a similar situation. And in, in a way, I wish, I mean, it's too late oh, now, you, I mean, obviously. Oh, no, no, you, 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 just a couple of questions. Obviously, uh, Longboat Key Town, uh, which, as you say, is very low, and so it gets 50%, but half were, after all, seasonal homes. Right. I couldn't do better than that. When we actually report the final number, which is different from the initial response rate, which is what we call the return rate, which we report after we've done all the vacant deletes and seasonal homes, it will come in at 100% if all of them <laughs> came in. So they will get that credit. We'll make sure they get that credit. Um, and, and indeed, across the, across the country, there, we know there to be roughly 9% 9, 9 or so of, of seasonal homes, vacant homes, and so forth. And we, about 9.3% 9, 9 of, of, of households, of, of addresses in the United States at any given time are, are one way or the other vacant. Mm -hmm. um, now, you, I, think you, I think your question, sir, on um, why we didn't have a better procedure in place for identifying the seasonal homes uh, is a completely fair question. I wish we had them. Uh, I, I, in, in retrospect, it's one of those things which it would have been better to have tried to identify those households so we don't have to send out a non-response uh, follow-up. We think that will happen fairly fast. I mean, someone will get to that neighborhood and, and somebody will say, well, yes, these are these five people have all driven back up to uh, Detroit, these five addresses, and they will all be ticked off as seasonal vacant, vacant housing units. But nevertheless, if there had been a, a better way to have done that, why, in my judgment, we should have, we should have done it. Let me, let me ask one more question about Florida, and that's in, in the Tampa area. There's been several articles, front page stories in the Tampa Tribune, and about concerns about problems within the Tampa operations. I, I'm curious if you're aware of them and get your assurance that uh, you know, we're going to resolve it. I know Mr. Davis, uh, who uh, represents Tampa, I represent the southern part of Hillsborough County, and I know I think the GL has expressed that they'd be willing to help out on it, but I, I just need to get your assurances that the problems in Hillsborough uh, are going to be addressed. Yes. Well, two things, if I could uh, address there. First, the response rate right now from Hillsborough is right on target. It's, it's roughly 10%. Uh, it's 1990 rate, which is roughly where the country is. So there at least is not any kind of big variation in Hillsborough from the response rate. Uh, certainly in Tampa, uh, there is an early and continuing recruitment problem. And that, sir, had to do with the quality of our management staff. Uh, we had to change the management staff, and we think that we've s seriously upgraded it. I can't explain to you exactly what went wrong there today because the person who, uh, who had to be let go is not, re not signed his privacy release form, so we cannot discuss that. But, um, but I can tell you that, um, that the Census Bureau made the decision that we knew that we did not have strong management in the Tampa office, and we acted quickly and made sure you do have a strong... Uh, we are expecting right now in the Tampa office uh, not to hit our 100% recruitment goal. Uh, we're expecting by the time we close down the recruitment phase, that is the April 19th target date, although we keep recruiting beyond that, we'll be at about 70%. However, we have already determined that in the surrounding areas, we have an oversupply of, uh, of, of in our recruitment pool and that we will be able to borrow r roughly the same kind of people as we would have been hiring in Tampa. The good news is once we put a, bo a good management team in place, the recruitment effort just shot up immediately. It's not that the labor pool wasn't there, it's that our procedures were not very effective. But I would finally say that the, um, the Tampa article that you referred to, and I have it right in front of me, the Tampa Tribune, uh, does use as its primary source of information the, uh, the very individual that Carolyn Maloney just talked about. Um, I must say, when a member of the monitoring board staff says the following, most cities say they are being roadblocked by the Census Bureau from completing their task. I, I would be hesitant to take that person's testimony as a testimony about what's going on. I mean, I, I, who could actually believe that the Census Bureau was trying not to count cities across the country? Most cities in the country this is, not in Florida, but in the country he's attributing this to. So I would urge us not to overinterpret a particular newspaper article, especially if the source of information is from someone who's willing to make those kinds of charges. Well, I mean, 
there were problems in Tampa, as you are acknowledging. Yeah, and so yeah. the problems are not just because one person made some statements. Obviously, they, were, they should not have made. But uh, I mean, they're legitimate problems. And you are addressing them. And you're, you know, the resources are there. And so I think we can give assurances that, you know, that yes, sir. No, you're going to do everything they can to make sure, you know. We, we, and not, not, not because the subcommittee happens to be from, or the chairman happens to be from that area, but Tampa was one of the problems, and indeed, uh, and we did act, I think, very aggressively and, and very successfully. And I, I can really be very reassuring that on the key issues, the response rate, quality of the partnership program, and the recruitment rate, we are now on, on, on schedule, on target. We will not hit our recruitment level, but we are, we've, and not to forget, we, it is a five to one ratio. Uh, and so uh, we don't going to need all of those people. But nevertheless, we would like to have hit our target there. We won't, but we're convinced that we will have the number of people we will need to do the non-response follow-up. I've been impressed with the operation in my hometown of Brayton. Yeah. Ms. Maloney. Uh, Dr. Pruitt, for the, for the sake of our television audience and people who may be watching this, what should someone do if they have not received their questionnaire and they would like to get their census form? Yeah. What should they do? Yeah. The... Uh, as, as I think the chairman correctly said, at this stage, uh, the most important thing to do is to call the uh, telephone assistance number, the 1-800-471-9424 number. And we will still try to get the form to you. The reason that we stress that process is because by asking our system for a questionnaire, we then can have, we have your address because we know we've mailed it, which means that we can geocode it more easily when it comes back in. So it's a stronger response. In addition, of course, we have the Be Counted system, which is a safety net system. We, uh, we do not, we hope that a lot of people uh, don't have to rely on the Be Counted system because it's a much harder geocoding problem. Uh, but we certainly want people to use it if there's no other way for them to get a form, to use a Be Counted form. Um, and and so finally, I do remind people, there are certain people who do live in the new construction area. We will find them during the near con new construction. And we also have the non-response follow-up. Uh, mm -hmm. If there's an address there, we'll be knocking on the door if a form didn't come in. And what should people, again, for our, our listening <clears throat> public, if they received two forms, if they have two apartments in the same uh, city or two houses, so they, they have access to their other form, what should they do with the second form? If, if they're two separate residences, then they do have to follow the residency rules that, uh, that the chairman uh, correctly said are problematic, especially when it's roughly six months here and six months there. Uh, we, would, we urge them to follow the residency rules, which is to sort of use the form at the residence that they most frequently uh, occupy. Uh, mail back the other one? Well, that's, that goes to the chairman's question. I actually got one in a place which was also not, uh, this is where I'm not living, but I did get that form. I did myself, mailed it back in. I put in a zero. Uh, so so is that what you'd like to tell there. people now? Just put a big zero and mail it back? And mail it back so that we hopefully will then get that out of our non-response fault. It, it'll be difficult to, to do that, of course. But maybe they'll come in and that'll be a clue. What, what if someone, um, say they have three apartments in one city that they keep for business reasons or whatever, and they get three different forms. No, we... They mail them back, all three. Would your system catch that? Would they catch the name? It's very, very difficult. We obviously have deduplication processes that try to find those people, but we do end up in the census with an overcount. And one of the things that the accuracy and coverage evaluation does is identify the number of people, the proportion of people who actually end up sending more than one form in. And not to forget, in 1990, uh, when we talk about the undercount number, we talk about a net which sort of was the difference between the number we double counted and the number who were undercounted. So we do get duplicate reforms in. We try to find them, but we cannot find them. We will have to use the American community, or the ACE, excuse me, Accuracy and Coverage Evaluation to detect that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I just uh, want to reemphasize how unfortunate it is that some talk show hosts and some elected officials have really called the census the long form optional. But I, I want to really compliment major newspapers and writers across this country that have come out with strong editorials in support of uh, an accurate census, in support of the long form, and urging everyone uh, to not listen to any elected official who is saying otherwise. And I have with me the Seattle Times. Uh, we have roll call here in our own, uh, here in, in Washington, the Tulsa, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Milwaukee Journal, the Atlanta Times, the Sacramento Bee, the uh, uh, Memphis paper in, in Tennessee, the, the
the commercial appeal, um, most of your uh, Atlantic Journal Constitution, and, and they keep coming into my office. So I, I think the, the press in the country has responded in a very responsible way in encouraging people to be part of this civic ceremony that uh, you've worked so hard on. And I yield back the balance of my time. Um. I, I've got several other questions, but because of the sake of time, we want to go on to jail. But let me make a couple of comments. I, I have some questions about proxy data and how you know close out verification, some things you started to comment on, and I, I really like to discuss some more. Um, by the way, did you see the Dave Barry column the other day? I'm going to make sure oh, you get a copy. Yeah. <laughs> that was still very funny. <laughs> you got, very we have funny. to have a sense of humor sometimes. No, I, I, I like that one a lot. <laughs> uh, and that particular one. And by the way, I, I know oh, you're very. Uh, David wrote it, but have you seen the Dave Barry one? It's good. I'll get a copy. Right. But uh, I mean, we have to have a sense of humor. Oh, I, I appreciate uh, that. Uh, and I don't mean to point up something, but I know you're very loyal about this, but you're missing your pen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just sitting here all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've got dozens of them in every coat no, you have. Actually, I know you, you've been giving them away, uh, but uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate the chairman. Before we get off camera, uh, okay, let me get my pen on. Because right. this is your future. Don't leave it blank. That's I've been right. really good. I got Thank lots you. of them. I have a, every you, coat sir. I have now. I have That's my right. pen on. So uh, uh, I, I should say I know you're very conscientious about that <laughs> and uh, done a good job of promoting the census. So. Uh, thank you again for being here. It's a tough job. I you know, encourage everybody to complete the form as best they can. It is so critical uh, to the, the function of government. You, you know, you're very right. It's very serious of the quality of data. So uh, in conclusion, thank you very much, and um, we'll see thank you next sir. time. Cool. We'll take about a second and ask Mr. Mim to come forward. and. Um, I know you've asked those questions, but I wanted to say them again. If y'all can stand, uh, we have uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mim, uh, Mr. Robert Goldenkoff, and Mr. Mark Bird, who will be testifying. Would raise your right hand and say, do you soundly swear that the testimony you're about to give before the subcommittee will be the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. The record know that they answered in the affirmative. Uh, thank you again for being here today. Uh, let me just briefly say, since uh, we have people watching this in C-SPAN, that the General Accounting Office uh, is a nonpartisan uh, organization. They have a website that says, quote, the GAO's mission is to help Congress oversee federal programs and operations to assure accountability to the American people. GAO evaluators, auditors, lawyers, economists, public policy analysts, information technology specialists, and other multidisciplinary professionals seek to enhance the economy, efficiency, effectiveness, and credibility of the federal government. Um, we have relied on GAO as to all the operations of Congress oversight uh, to rely on them for years. We appreciate it. Mr. Mim, you were involved in the 1990 census, so we really appreciate the uh, knowledge that you contribute to this. So at this stage, let me ask you to make an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman and Mrs. Maloney, it is uh, again an honor to uh, appear before you today. Um, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, I am, I'm joined by Robert Goldenkoff, who's a familiar face to this subcommittee, and Mark, my colleague Mark Bird, who has day-to-day -day responsibility for our work on census data processing issues. This afternoon, I'll, I'll briefly hit the highlights of my written statement in six areas. First, on the mail response rate. Second, on recruitment. Third, on update leave operations. Fourth, service-based enumeration, or the counter of uh, parts of the homeless population, fifth on the questionnaire assistance centers, and finally six on data capture. First in regards to the mail response rate. As Director Pruitt noted, as of April 1, the national rate was about 55 percent. 
Figures one and two in my prepared statement show the progress of the mail response in the, at the regional and local levels. As you can see from those charts, overall the news is good thus far. Overall, about 90% of local census offices are three quarters or more of the way towards achieving the final response rate they had in 1990, which of course is a higher benchmark than uh, the Bureau has budgeted for this time. Meeting or doing that even better than the 1990 mail response rates would go a long way towards ensuring an accurate and complete census. Second, the, the Bureau is making progress in meeting its recruiting goals, but certainly continued efforts are still needed. As Director Pruitt noted, the national goal of 2.4 million qualified applicants has been met. But about 41 percent of the local census offices have not met the Bureau's most recent, that is March 30, recruitment goal, compared to about 53 percent that had not met the goal as of March 2nd. So we are seeing real progress at the national level and indeed even at the local level, but we still have verging on half of the census offices that, it, that are not where they need to be in terms of recruitment. Third. Over 24 million update leave questionnaires were delivered by about 70,000 census field staff. While national data are not yet available, our observations of update leave suggest it improved the quality of the address list, including correcting for potential lapses in earlier address list development efforts. If these corrections are accurately reflected in the maps and address binders and keyed inaccurately, they will reduce problems with non-response follow-up. Fourth. The Bureau's service-based enumeration operation attempts to count individuals who lack conventional housing when they go for services such as to shelters or soup kitchens, as well as attempting to capture them at targeted outdoor locations. Despite great effort on the part of the Bureau, the inherent challenge of counting this population combined with operational problems makes the completeness and accuracy of this data uncertain. Overall, several dozen, through several dozen field observations in 12 different locations, we noted that the operation was well staffed and received the cooperation of service providers. In addition, enumerators largely approached their jobs with dedication, professionalism, and respect for the dignity of the population they were enumerating. Mrs. Maloney, you mentioned that uh, you and Chairman Miller were out in the streets that night and, and saw that firsthand. I had the opportunity to be out there and see it firsthand as well. For example, a team of, of enumerators I accompanied during the early morning hours of March 29th, um, while you were in Washington, I was in Roslyn, Virginia, searched heavy underbrush along the Potomac River searching for an encampment of the homeless. This was truly impressive. They, they were going, it's, uh, the, the bridge that's leaving, the walking bridge leading over to Roosevelt Island. There were three different ways that they went in there with their flashlights and they were determined to find that encampment. And indeed, they did find evidence that that's where home, homeless people resided. There, there weren't any people there at that point, but they found the mattresses and, the, and, and clothes and other personal belongings. On the other hand, however, we also observe the challenges that the Bureau faces in trying to count individuals without a usual, usual residence. In some locations, a police presence, the weather, the, ter the tornado, for example, down in Texas, and the terrain hampered enumerators' ability to find people living on the streets. In addition, however, a lack of sufficient supplies, inadequate enumerator training in some cases, inconsistent procedures for handling rejections, and inadequate advanced planning undermine the quality of the count in the areas we observed. Overall, however, while these problems may have affected the quality and completeness of the count and therefore should not be minimized, it is not surprising that they occurred in such a large and complex undertaking. My fifth point this afternoon is that the Bureau continues to work to ensure that its 23,700 questionnaire assistance centers are available to the intended populations. My prepared statement provides examples from Laredo and Del Rio, Texas of some of the successful efforts that we observed. On the other hand, however, we also saw less input from local partners and less promotion in other local census offices we visited, for example, in Oklahoma and Virginia, although assistance centers were open in those areas as well. Finally, let me turn to data capture operations. As Director Pruitt note, pointed out, the Bureau reports that the data capture operations are working successfully. Available operational data tends to confirm that view. But I would also note that some risks still remain that warrant the continued attention of this subcommittee and others. In our February report, we expressed concern that the short time between the conclusion of the development and test activities of the data capture system and the date when data capture operations would begin created the risk that new problems would come to light after the system was in use. This, in fact, is occurring. In fixing these new problems, the Bureau has had to delay some important changes. As we discussed at the subcommittee's March 2nd hearings, under the two-pass approach to data processing, the Bureau is making two sets of software modifications. The first set of changes were completed in February, and the second was to be completed by April 27th. The Bureau has now delayed completion until May 31st because it needs to divert personnel to address the, new, the newly arising data capture problems. 
If new problems continue to surface, the completion of the second release will be increasingly at risk. On behalf of the subcommittee, Mr. Chairman and Mrs. Maloney, we will continue to track data processing and other key census operations. And this uh, concludes my, my statement, and I'll be happy to take any questions that, uh, that you may have. Let me start off with a question about the long form. Yes, sir. And problems. And, um, I, the, one of the questions that I asked uh, Director Prude about the differential on the dress rehearsal that was, I think, between 10 and 15 percent differential on that. Um, in the dress rehearsal that should have given us a warning sign of a problem. Uh, you know, Director Prue didn't think that was a warning sign. I mean, do you, uh, I mean, maybe we, you know, slipped us all by us all, but I don't know. I mean, looking back at it, it should have told us, hey, there is a concern about privacy and we need to, you know, you know, it was too late at that stage to change the long form. We had to get the data, but uh, maybe there's some other way we could have promoted it or something. Do you have a comment on that? Well, I think there, there, there were plenty of, of warning signs in, in hindsight, and some of which that the Bureau certainly was re responded to. And that's why they sought to streamline the census form, both the short form and the long form this time, make the entire approach more user-friendly, have a, an advertising program that was targeted at uh, what it means to you and your community to, you know, it's your future, don't leave it blank. And so there, um, in addition to all the issues that uh, Mr. Ryan was mentioning and you were mentioning in your questions, Mr. Chairman, that there was there was a broad acknowledgement that generally um, public attitudes and concern about confidentiality and privacy and the invasiveness um, were out there. In, in an electronic age, those those feelings are, are certainly strong. Um, it, there was indeed a, a difference in the uh, um, or a growth in the the difference in the. Um, the long form, short form, male response rates between, um, between 1990 and the dress rehearsal. But then on the other hand, as the, as the director has pointed out, um, male response rates in the dress rehearsal are generally not predictive of the way they work in the 1990 census. One of the things that we are trying to track down that I, I, I need to take a look at and haven't been able to, to locate is the um, differential long form, short form response rates from the 1988 dress rehearsal, that is the dress rehearsal before the 1990 census. And that will give us all a feel of, of whether or not there was more of an issue out there that uh, we should have been attentive to. Yeah, I was, I was looking for that information myself, so I'll be glad and if you just let us know, I'd be curious myself. Um, let me talk a couple questions about the Data Capture Center, and I think uh, we're, the report is that things are going well, but you mentioned that the Bureau has assured you that all the problems found through the foresight test have been resolved. Uh, please discuss the problems experienced, and do you have documentation of the problems have been resolved. Just as a, as a reminder, the, uh, the foresight test was the, the fundamental test that they were going to take in, or that they did take at the end of February, the last week in February, the 22nd to the 25th, that was to test all operations in an integrated way. At the time of our last testimony, we expressed c some concern about, uh, uh, about the completeness of that, that test and the lack of information that was available to us at that point. We have since seen the report um, that has come out, and, and I guess, uh, Mark, you're most familiar with that, so uh, why don't you yes. tell him? Uh, we received the report on the foresight test about a week ago, and we've reviewed it. The report itself uh, does a pretty good job of documenting many of the problems and the resolution of the problems. In addition to that, the system development contractor has an extensive process for identifying, tracking, and resolving uh, problems, and that is an effective process. Uh, by way of example, Excuse me. One of the problems that was identified was that there was a discrepancy between the number of forms, uh, the, I'm sorry, the number of data files that had been transmitted to headquarters and the number of data files that had been reported as transmitted to headquarters. That discrepancy has been resolved. You mentioned that the contractor uh, had proposed eliminating system acceptance testing, a government witness activity to ensure quality to save time. Please discuss in further detail on what are the implications of this. Um, in uh, a large system development uh, and acquisition effort such as uh, DCS 2000 is, it's important for the acquiring organization, which of course is in this case is the federal government, have uh, some insight into the contractor's progress in, in the development of the system. And uh, heretofore in the DCS 2000 program, uh, that has been accomplished in part by system acceptance testing, which has been witnessed by the government. Uh, so if, in fact, as has been proposed, a uh, system acceptance testing on the uh, ongoing development work of DCS 2000 is eliminated, uh, we would be concerned if that is, is 
if that previously had been the only opportunity for the government to witness testing, we would be very concerned about that. We don't yet know whether that is in fact the case because the plans for the ongoing DCS uh, 2000 development have not been finalized yet. Let me ask a question about the recruiting, and I'm going to bring up the Tampa issue. Uh, you know, as we've said before, I mean, you know, recruiting can be successful in New York, but you can't transfer the workers to Arizona to solve the problem because it's all a very local issue. Though he said with respect to the Tampa issue that there are surrounding areas, I'm assuming in the St. Petersburg or, uh, area or Lakeland or some close by areas. Um, and is, but how serious a problem is this? I think you mentioned, I thought half the... Uh, uh, local census offices are uh, understaffed at this stage as far as the number of potential uh, non-response follow-up workers. Um, and how uh, have they reacted adequately to address that issue? And any more elaboration you can give on that? Yes, sir. About 41% uh, about of the district offices have not met their most recent recruiting goal. Um, and this is a, a bit of an issue of concern. I mean, what it, I mean, obviously, in a large national undertaking like this, kind of the normal distribution applies. So you have some that are doing very, very well, a lot in the middle, one would hope, and then some that trail off at the end. Um, and there are indeed some that are tra that are trailing off at the end. And the, the national numbers are taking advantage of the fact that uh, the Denver region and Dallas region are are approaching 120 percent of goal. Um, and so it, it is a, a bit of concern, or at least it's a, a still a, reg a reason to watch and to continue as. Director Pruitt said they certainly will do aggressive recruiting down at the, the, the local level. Um, it, when, in regards to your comment about is it, you know, how feasible is it to move people across areas and have them work in, in different offices, in, in some cases that can work. I mean, it, it, uh, it adds additional travel cost, of course, to the Bureau um, because they, they do pay mileage for, for people. Um, the, the issue, though, is that generally they find census takers want to enumerate neighborhoods that they're familiar with, and people want to be enumerated by people that they're familiar with. And so to the extent that you try and move people or ask people to work successfully in different neighborhoods, um, it, it usually you usually find a lot of refusal to work, and you usually find that uh, the people just are, are also refusing. Well, how serious to is that 41 percent number that you're using? Is 41 well, percent of the LCOs are not adequately uh, hired up. Is that right? It's it's and I and I appreciate sir. This is going to be an unsatisfying answer. It's it's hard to say at this point. In that, um, on the one hand, um, the bureau has been able to staff their operations to date. As we noted in the in the written statement, it's it's an important achievement that they had 70,000 people out there on the ground doing update leave and didn't report significant staffing problems. As Director Pruitt noted, though, that the the uh, the big Kahuna, as it were, is non-response follow-up, where they're going to have 500,000 or more on the ground. Um, that becomes an enormous challenge for them. Thus. Thus far, it appears that the recruitment program, the, uh, um, the geographic pay rates, which are much higher and more aggressively managed this time than they were in 1990, and certainly the, the, recruitment, problem gen pro the recruitment process generally is more aggressively managed this time than in 1990, seems to, seems to be paying off in, in many areas. But these 41% these of the offices that uh, are, in our view, are the ones that uh, uh, bear some scrutiny. What we're going to be doing over the coming days is we get a better feel for where our mail response rate shaking out by local census office is to compare these two and try and come up with a, a set of offices that are having both recruitment problems and mail response problems. And that will allow all of us, I think, and I, I know the Bureau does the exact same thing, will allow all of us to have a, a defined subset of, of what are the likely offices that will be the most challenging. That, are they correlated? Like Tampa has a reasonably good response rate, but the recruiting effort, I mean, that's a management problem, as Director Pruitt said. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they, they don't necessarily correlate. Not, not necessarily. In, right. in some cases, they, uh, they do. One of the things that uh, I think is good to see this time is that the, the, the pattern has been broken. In 1990, it was much more of a historical pattern where they had poor male response. They also had an awful lot of problems with, uh, um, with recruitment. In this case, in this, uh, for, for 2000, you are still seeing some poor male response. We uh, um, discussed when Mr. Davis was here, and, and you know, he discussed the problems that they're having in Chicago. Um, they're having some problems in New Orleans. They're having, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, eight to ten offices where they're having the, the biggest challenges in terms of mail response. Um, those are not necessarily the offices where they're having the biggest recruitment problems. And, and so in some cases there's correlations, but it, it's not as uniform as it was last time. Thank you. Ms. Maloney? Okay, th thank you very much. Uh, f for the record, I'd, since it was such a large discussion at our last hearing, have you, uh, Mr. Min, have in, had any um, access problems? 
since uh, our last hearing. No, ma'am. In fact, uh, on the contrary, I um, was able to talk to uh, um, senior bureau people over the last week or so, spoke with uh, Director Pruitt, Deputy Director Barham today, and told them that uh, we continue to have good cooperation with them. Our access issues were resolved, as I mentioned at the last hearing. We had a number of people that were on the field during the uh, um, soup kitchen and uh, shelter and what they call the targeted non-shelter outdoor location, tinsel. Um, and it, you, you use that term and everyone says, I don't know what you mean, in the streets, you know, in other place location. Um, they were very, very cooperative in that and, and very accommodating and um, um, hopeful and fully expecting it will continue to be that way because of, of the efforts of the Bureau and certainly the efforts of the subcommittee as well to, to make sure we had appropriate access. On, on the substance of, of your report, um, your testimony reflects the usual thorough job of, of GAO and it points out a number of what I would call minor challenges, but it certainly doesn't seem to be anything that would threaten the success of the 2000 census. And in fact, I read your testimony or hear your testimony as essentially good news. Is that a proper characterization? I, I would agree. Yes, ma'am. The, uh, the, as we have been saying now for many months, the, the, the linchpin of a successful census is a high male response rate. And at this point, we're looking at a pretty good male response rate. The, uh, um, the, uh, depending on the bump that the, the Bureau gets over the next couple of days, the, uh, the, the Census Bureau director mentioned that they're already at 57 percent, or that's the numbers that will come out mm -hmm. today. Um, within the next day or so, we will see any bump that they got from April 1. Um, and then if he gets an, another hit uh, coming next week, we could be well over 61 percent in approaching the 1990 numbers. As we've said before, each percentage point is 1.2 million fewer cases that need non-response follow-up and about $34 million that, that could be better spent. That's an that's a important point that, that you raised. The, the, the two principal risks that you raised in, in December were the Bureau's mail response time and, and also the, the very tight labor market uh, which you've been discussing. And, and overall, how would you um, rate the response rate? Very good, uh, extremely well, at good? Point, at, at this point, it, it, it does seem quite good that, the, uh, as I mentioned, 90 percent of the local census offices are at three quarters or more, which means they're certainly within striking distance of the male response rate that they got within 1990. And I, I agree with what Director mm -hmm. Pruitt was saying, that the, the, the relevant indicator for most um, district offices or local census offices is, is not the national rate. It's doing better than you did in 1990. I mean, it's just un unreasonable to compare. Um, there are, you know, there are continuing to, uh, some areas of concern in regards to the, the data processing that we mentioned. The big issue now is that uh, irrespective of a good male response rate is to make sure that we get out of the field as quickly as possible. As we had been saying all along is that even with the Bureau's assumptions, which would be a 61 percent male response rate, they were still looking at up, uh, following up on about 49 million cases in 10 weeks, which was shorter than the amount of time that it took mm -hmm. them to do in, in 1990. And so one of the concerns will be is that as we get towards the end of this operation, um, are we closing out those crew leader districts, as the director mentioned, prematurely, um, or, or you know, what sort of controls does the Bureau have in place to make sure we're not going to last resort or proxy data before they should? That's going to be the, the, the next big issue, I think. And uh, are you willing to make any predictions about where we might end up with these numbers? Um, I'd prefer not. <laughs> uh, I, I wish I could. I mean, and that's. I mean, I, I think the the bureau is taking ex exactly the right position on this, and that is a, a, a tone of cautious optimism. I mean, they um, it, they they know their response model shows that uh, as we get closer to that 61 percent, and even closer to you know 65 percent or 90 you know uh, 90 plus five. Um, it, it gets harder and harder to get because there now will be a pretty significant trail off. I mean, we're in order to get the 61 percent, um, we're looking at basically uh, another 750,000 cases per day in each of the next 10 days that will get us to April 11th. Can they make it? They, they, they certainly can. But then on the other hand, I would not be necessarily shocked if we came in just right below that either. I mean, to, but I, I think the news overall looks good for them on the mail response rate. Uh, how is the Bureau's um, Internet questionnaire response progressing? The, the Bureau had expected, um, it, it, it expected perhaps should be too strong a word, since it hadn't been tested before and they, um, it wasn't something that they put an enormous effort in. I guess the, the Bureau had, had 
uh, establish the possibility of, of getting up to a million responses to that. The reality is, is quite a bit lower, and they're not necessarily disappointed with that. It's in, in, in the neighborhood of the tens of thousands, I believe it's about 60 or, or 70,000. Uh, it's almost up to about 58,000. About 58,000 at this point. Um, we, at the uh, request of the, the subcommittee, had done some uh, preliminary looks at the security provisions that they had in place and came away um, convinced that at least at the, from the standpoint of the, the stated provisions, that is what they, the documentation provided, that they did have a pretty secure system there. They have done some testing to see if it could be hacked into, and it, our understanding is that it's been pretty successful in, in that regard. Um, the, the big issue with the Internet, I think, will be for the 2010 census. This was something, as I mentioned, that came very late in the census cycle, didn't get a test during the dress rehearsal. Um, as we look forward to 2010, the possibility of, of really, in a very specific and hard way, using the Internet and technology generally um, needs to be seriously investigated. I'm sure the Bureau will do that. You, you commented that uh, you felt that the homeless organization or homeless count could have been better organized. It, certainly was not the experience that Mr. Miller and I had. Um, they even swore us in. We said we've been sworn in I don't know how many times. They had insisted on swearing us in, and, and we uh, went out in a very organized way with the count. I, I, I read in the paper that Los Angeles, um, in that region, they used individuals from the homeless community mm -hmm. to accompany the enumerators as they went out on the street. I, I, was that done in New York City, do you know? Was that a process that was followed across the country? And, and what is the uniformity of it? It seems like a very good idea. The, uh, I, I, in regards to was it done in New York City, I'm not sure if it was done in New York City. I do know it was a provision that the Bureau had nationally. Those people were technically called gatekeepers and that they were to be exactly as you, you characterized, ma'am, the representatives or, or very close to or even the, of the homeless community or even homeless persons themselves that would basically be able to go into areas and say, hey, the census is here, it's okay, you don't need to be threatened. In fact, it's important for us to be enumerated. Um, in the observations that I did and my colleagues did, we didn't find that that was necessarily the case that they used the, the gatekeepers. Um, I didn't find, at least uh, certainly in any of the observations that I did, that it was a problem that those gatekeepers were not there, um, that the, the census uh, enumerators, as I mentioned in my statement, dealt with them, uh, with the, the people who, they were enumerating with professionalism, dedication, and, and certainly respect for the dignity of those individuals. In fact, they were, uh, one of the, the mantras that the Bureau had is that we do not wake up people who are sleeping. And there was a number of times when I noticed uh, census enumerators that were, were, were waiting for people waking up and were not about to, uh, to disturb people. And once they woke up, then they would go ahead and enumerate them. But uh, they made the judgment correctly, in our view, that it is better to have an enumerator standing around for a while than uh, disturb someone that's, uh, that's asleep. Well, thank you for your usual thorough presentation. And my time is up. Thank you very much. I do have a couple more questions. Okay. But uh, uh, I'd like to, there's an article this morning, by the way, CQ Daily Monitor, that uh, was a hearing over on the Senate side about privacy uh, yesterday on an appropriation subcommittee. And it's such a diverse group there on the privacy issue. It was uh, uh, somebody from Eagle Forum, uh, somebody from Public Citizen, somebody from PERG, Public Interest Research Group. Uh, somebody from the NAS National Center for Victims of Crime and the ACLU. We're all there. That is an eclectic group, uh, isn't it, sir? <laughs> so privacy is, you know, is an issue that's become more and more of a concern. Sure. This is actually during the driver's license, like happened in the state of Florida. So uh, I think it's worth including there. Um, you mentioned several problems inherent in conducting the update leave operations. And in addition to these, my staff have reports of children taking questionnaires off of doors or gates. What impact will all these problems have on the quality of data from these regions? Should we be concerned? Um, certainly. They, they, let me deal first with the um, with anyone removing a, a census form from a from a door. Um, what that requires is what that would be then is presumably a, a non-response um, requires the Census Bureau to, to hire and train and pay a census enumerator to make up to the six visits to try and get that family. And so that it, um, that is a, a very unfortunate occurrence if it happens even one time and extremely unfortunate if it's at all systematic and um, or, or happens, you know, and, and uh, quite often. Um, the types of problems that we found um, were, were twofold. One is that the uh, the need to do extensive updating of the address registers and the maps 
suggest in a positive way that the um, that doing update leave was you know, was an important step in order to clean up those maps and may have made some important additions and changes to um, and improvements to previous address listing uh, um, efforts. The key now will be to make sure that the changes get get consistently included in the non-response packet. So in other words, if an update leave enumerator went out there, found a problem with the map of the address re register, corrected it, and that doesn't get corrected and, and taken in, then the census enumerator who goes out for non-response, if, if they're sent out, may have exactly the same problem. They say, look, according to my map or address register, there should be a house here. I don't see this house. Um, so it's a, there, there are some, some real efficiency concerns in, in, in both of those instances. Uh, I'm hearing more and more accounts of late or unavailable supplies and also the questionnaire in different languages, both from you and other field operation people uh, from my staff. Uh, have you discerned the reason for these problems and how serious a problem <coughs> is this? Um, it, no, sir. We're still looking in to try and find out the reason. I, I will confirm, though, that the premise behind your statement is that when uh, virtually across operations and across ge geography in, in the nation, the local census offices, it does seem to be a nagging concern of a lack of supplies. And we're not just talking the, the papers and pens. I mean, we've been focusing on, on some of the more important things. Training supplies not getting there in time. Um, in the case of San Francisco, the, in, the short forms that they used to enumerate during the service-based enumeration did not get there in time, as I mentioned in my, my written statement. And so what happened is they had to photocopy the forms, which required that when the real forms come in, that they be recopied back at the local census office because each of them has to have a unique identifier on them. And so there, there are a number of these, these, these nagging stories of, of data, or, or I'm sorry, of supplies not getting out, and whether it be training kits or census forms or foreign language recruitment material as we've reported on in the past. So we reported on the last testimony, the um, census in the schools not getting out in time. Um, we're trying to still look at the, the causes of this, and, and uh, it could be everything from um, it's in the local office and they just don't know it yet, uh, you know, I mean, because we've all been to some of these local census offices where we see boxes and boxes and boxes of, of material to a, a problem with the distribution out of the Jeffersonville Center. Um, we're going to be looking into more of that and certainly continuing to track during non-response as to whether this is a, a, a pervasive problem. Well, there, there's obviously still some operational problems. Uh, one important lesson learned from the dress rehearsals was the importance of clear expectations and communications between the Census Bureau and community partners seems that the partnership program is having mixed results in 2000. Do you have a sense of why this is occurring? Do you feel that the Census Bureau has implemented outreach uniformly across America? They, they certainly offered outreach uniformly across America. The 39,000 governments were offered the opportunity to participate. As we've reported in, a, in, in previous statements and in a, in a couple of reports to the subcommittee, um, what we have found fairly consistently is a mismatch in expectations between local governments and the, the Census Bureau. Um, without going too far, it appears that a lot of these, this mismatch in expectations was particularly prevalent among some of the smaller or rural governments. But large cities, they, they have the expertise, they have the experience to, to, run, a, to, to run a complete count type of co uh, program. They know what they're doing. They understand certainly very clearly the stakes and an accurate count for them. What we found is once you get down to the, to the rural levels, especially when they'll, they'll have, you know, one or maybe even two employees at the local government to ask them to take on the additional responsibilities of being the chief promoter and, and organizer of the complete count efforts in that community can be very onerous. They, they don't know what they should be doing. They don't know how they can re rely on the Bureau. And so we have reported on some and found some unevenness in the um, promotion and outreach campaign, and particularly the complete count committee el element of that. In order to get a more systematic view and certainly to build towards lessons learned for 2010, we're going to be doing some more detailed work at uh, over the coming weeks down at the local level to try and get a feel for both in successful areas and less successful areas um, what are the key ingredients of, of an effective bureau, local government, nonprofit business partnership so we can build on that for 2010. Thank you. No, just let's, my, my last I, comment is I, I hope I, everyone who has not filled out their form will <laughs> be part of the census. Don't leave your future blank. Uh, do what the chairman says. This is a bipartisan effort. It's a responsibility of every resident in America. And as you pointed out, it's going to cost us more if you don't fill it out because we have to have enumerators. So it's important. Fill out your form. Yes, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you again for being here. Uh, I really sir. appreciate your uh, 
uh, oversight responsibilities of GAO as that independent uh, congressional body that uh, in a bipartisan fashion can keep on top of the issues. And so we appreciate the job you are doing. Uh, next week, I think we have uh, the uh, Congressional Monitoring Board before this uh, subcommittee. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses' written opening statements be included in the record without objection. <coughs> so ordered. In case there are additional questions that members may have uh, for, for our witnesses, I ask unanimous consent for the record to remain open for two weeks for members to submit questions for the record and that the witnesses submit written answers as soon as practicable. I would also like to submit the Census Monitoring Board's Congressional Members Request for Oversight Materials mentioned in my opening statement for the record. Re without objection, so ordered. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, Thank you. sir. Well, congratulations, Mr. Chairman. I think that was a successful. <laughs> Let's just yeah. hope those numbers keep going up. Yeah, I think good we're going to have a good one. Thank you, Mr. Next, a discussion by the American Bar Association on antitrust laws. Then we'll hear from Smith.